So here we are again. I got a couple jackets with leather elbow patches. I got a oh, yeah. yeah, tweeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are they tweeds? I, you know, it's a corduroy jacket. Oh, that's, that works. Yeah, that yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. You ready? Can I introduce you? Hey, everyone. Good morning. It's Monday. You made it. A few of you made it through the rain. Hopefully, there's more of you back at home who are zooming in. But um, I'm glad you came in because my friend Jacob Katz is here. Jacob got his PhD, I don't know, a few years ago here at UC Davis. Uh, along with me, we come from the same lab under Peter Moyle, so we're academic siblings. But Jacob has gone on to great things as the chief head scientist or the senior scientist at Caltrout, uh, which is a major conservation organization for Salmonids. And uh, Jacob has been spearheading some, you know, what's, you know, a whole bunch of things that seem like good ideas that nonetheless are controversial. And um, he is going to walk you through his trials and tribulations and hopefully provide a little inspiration along the way. I Jacob, was, thanks a lot for coming in. Thank you so much, John, for having me. Hey, everyone, can you hear me all right? Come on down, guys. Excellent. Well, uh, I, I took this class in grad school. I TA'd it. I don't remember much of it because I was madly in love with the woman who became my wife. But that's not licensed not to pay attention today. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And we are going to take a little break. Uh, you know, morphology, comparative, evolutionary biology, et cetera, I love, fascinated by, not my strong suit. Um, I'm a conservation biologist. I came to school because there was only one thing that really mattered to me, and that was I knew where home was. I knew where I was from, and I knew that I had a couple ideas that no one seemed to want to listen to me. I was just some punk kid. Uh, Peter Moyle was good enough to give me a spot. I'm not sure my grades really would have uh, made me stand out on paper. But what I learned here has really just propelled this project that I'm going to talk to you about and the work that we're doing. So California Trout, uh, I'm lead scientist for California Trout, uh, is a 50-year-old conservation organization focused on healthy rivers, cold, clean, flowing water with healthy populations of fish. And that's good enough in its own right, but this is California. What's the California economy run on? Well, first of all, how big is the California economy? At least that big. Give me a ranking. Right over here. She raised her hand. Yeah. Fifth largest on earth, right? So it, it kind of goes back and forth with the entire economy of France as where it gets ranked in there. Huge. Now, I know we talk a lot about the digital age and Silicon Valley, and we think we're, you know, the navel of the earth when it comes to that. Uh, but California's economy doesn't run on silicone, does it? What's it run on? A lot of it came out of the sky yesterday. Water, right? This, this economy really runs on the flow of water. And the flow of water in this state means from where? It means from north, where it's relatively abundant, to the south, where the people are and where the economy is. You know? And that, that could be the South Bay, or it could be the South San Joaquin Valley, or it could be LA, San Diego, point south. So... The work that we're doing is really about placing, placing this, this love of California, of the incredible heritage. Why do we love California so much, right? There's so many reasons. Here, name a couple. Shout them out. Over here. Diversity. I think diversity is the right, the right word. I, I couldn't hear the first part. Bird. Bird diversity. Right. So bird diversity. Why, why that bird diversity? There's a lot of species. Why are there so many species of birds in California? We have habitat. We have a diversity of habitat. The landscape itself, this place that goes from redwoods and rainforest in the north, right, to deserts in the south, from the highest point in the continental U.S. to the lowest, right? We're here in the middle of the Sacramento Valley, 
what do people say when you come to Davis, right? Oh, it's great. I like Davis because it's an hour, hour and a half to skiing or an hour and a half to the coast, right? Well, which is amazing. But you actually miss the fact that the valley itself is a fantastic place as well, a place that we're going to talk about a lot today. So that diversity is the point that I was getting at, is, is that there's this incredible heterogeneity. And what does that mean? It means that there are all these different little niches, all these wonderful cracks and crevices, all these different ways in which animals and plants, life generally, adapts, speciates, becomes special. That's the thing about California. It is so special. I couldn't live anywhere else. I love this place. And that's what this, this lecture will be all about. It's just, is is how we apply this 21st century ecological thinking that we're all in the midst of right now, that you guys are learning, that you're breathing in, that you understand in a way that we did not when the state was built. When the infrastructure that creates the, the flow, the flow of power, the flow of money, the flow of water from some part of the state to another, that was all done in a time when we knew very little about bird diversity, about how rivers work, how fish use them. So that's what this lecture is going to be about, is, is integrating that ecological understanding of nature and how nature works into a state built at a time when we really didn't just not know, but didn't really give a, you know, no one gave a shit how, how salmon were going to fare when we were building most of the Central Valley. All right. So we're going to talk about cultivating ecological solutions on the agricultural lands of the Sacramento Valley, right here where you all live. The, the, the fields that you see out your window driving up I-5 or across 80 over to Sacramento, right? And we're going to do that by mimicking natural processes. We're not going back. But if we understand how nature works, if we understand those processes that create and sustain those diverse habitats, if we allow our native critters to recognize the Sacramento Valley that they're adapted to, that they evolved under, all those morphological chain, you know, in characters you've been talking about, they're all shaped by selection, by the landscape, by the co-evolution of populations and a changing landscape. Let's take that evolutionary perspective and apply it to everyday conservation. When we do that, entirely different sets of outcomes are possible. So the Sacramento Valley, we now know as this, um, that's, that's fine, John, right? You, you tended to, to think of it as this incredible mosaic of farm fields. It's one of the most productive agricultural valleys on earth, right? But before that, it was this mosaic of different wetlands. Next slide, please. Right? So this is just a a slide showing the Sacramento looking north. The different shades are just to designate, to, to, to denote different kinds of wetlands. The Sacramento Valley is really a large river wetland corridor. It was this amazing place where every winter and every spring, and it's particularly, you know, germane, we, we, we can relate to it today when no doubt you saw many a puddle on your way to work today, right? On your, on your way to in, into class, right? So, so when it would rain like it did last night or every winter, every spring, snow melt, the rivers would rise. And when they did, they would spill out over natural levees and fill in this mosaic of different wetlands. Millions of acres of different kinds of wetlands. There would have been emergent vegetation. What's that? Just, uh, you know, tules different kinds of, of marsh grasses, uh, but there also would have been riparian jungle along the higher grounds, along the rivers. You would have had willow thickets along Pewter Creek, moving into the Pewter Creek sink. I have an 1885 map that says, right now, where the bike path would take you under 80, like you're headed out towards, towards South Davis. Right in that area, it was all cross-hatched with willows, and it says, beware, ax bears. Uh, ax bears are grizzlies, right? So that was all right here. Um, that, that mosaic of different kinds of wetlands, it wasn't the same every year. A different water year, a different event, uh, a different uh, 
amount of water flowing through across under into the landscape would have created different habitats in different places in different years. But what it did was created this incredible mosaic diversity, right? And remember, it doesn't matter if you're investing in the stock market, if you're trying to create a, a stable population of chickens laying eggs, right? Agriculturally, it doesn't matter in what system you're talking about. Diversity is always the foundation of resilience, always. And so what happened? We had this incredibly diverse landscape. But a diverse doesn't mean that it's static. It doesn't mean it's the same. It was always shifting, but shifting in a way where you had similar balance of, of different kinds of habitats. Oh, I keep thinking that I'm controlling things, John. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Um, so the Sac Valley, right? We're in Yolo County, Sacramento County. It's across the river to the north. We have Calusa, uh, Sutter. Before those were the names of our counties, they were names of flood basins. What's a flood basin? A flood basin is a shallow, you know, kind of uh, area, basically an ephemeral lake that would fill up with waters from the Sacramento or its tribu uh, tributaries every wet season. So if, uh, who knows where Arco Arena is? Right, where, where's that? Over in Sacramento, right? That's called the Natomas Basin to the north of uh, Sacramento. The Natomas is, you know, the mostly strip malls and housing developments now. If the levee were to breach just across the causeway in the, in the, from the Sacramento River back into the Natomas Basin, the only thing you'd see, you wouldn't see any of those strip malls. You wouldn't even see the chimneys of those, you know, nice condos. You'd just see the top of Arco Arena. That area was called Fisherman's Lake. It's 26 feet deep under regular flood events. We have fundamentally changed the way that water flows across the landscape. And primarily what that meant has just been straight jacketed in rivers keeping that water, getting that water off the landscape as quick as possible and keeping it within walled river systems, right? So development of the valley, the last 170 years since European arrival here, um, you know, people can make that pretty complicated. It doesn't need to be, next slide, right? This idea of, 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 of making levees, and there's 13,000 miles of levees within, within the Delta and the Sacramento Valley. Those, here, maybe go back. Those levees aren't complicated. That's a pile of dirt, right? You take dirt from one side, you pile it up next to not just the river, but every little stream, the little, the little ephemeral streams that run through the neighborhoods where you live. All of them have been incised. They've all been channelized. People are really good at getting water off the landscape, right? It's right there in the language. You, know, you gotta drain the swamp, it's progress. What we're gonna talk about today is, yes, that's super important. We're here out in the middle of a vast floodplain. Our state capital couldn't exist if we didn't do this, right? We couldn't live here. Yet, there are a lot of unintended consequences as well. Does that mean we can't have one for, you know, without the other? No, not at all. Let's, let's figure out how to balance them, right? So this next piece I think is really important. Next slide. Which is just that those levees and then the complete ubiquitous drainage of the other side of the levee, right? You don't just separate the river from the landscape. Then on the landscape side, you do a lot of small little things. You grade, you make little ditches, right? Those ditches really fundamentally change the way that water interacts with the landscape. It's drainage, but that ubiquitous drainage might be what humans do more than anything else as far as changing the landscape, right? We're kind of like anti-beavers to some extent. Um, and when you've lost 95% of your wetlands in the, in the valley, what we find is that you've not only lost a huge amount of bird habitat, but those same wetlands were really important to fish. So when I was here working with Peter Moyle, it's a completely different thing, lecturing with and without a mask. It's like an echo chamber in here. Um, so uh, next slide, please. When I was here, uh, and I think you can click this one once or twice. There we go. So uh, this was some of the work I did uh, as a PhD student here with Peter Moyle. 
Um, and we actually went out and, and went to look at the incredible diversity of fish life that's here in the state of California. There's actually 132 different kinds of native fish. And that was part of the, the job was to, you know, make the call, make those taxonomic calls on, on what was a distinct taxon, what, you know, what wasn't. Um, and uh, that was super interesting. It definitely, everything that you will learn in this class applied directly. Um, but the conservation application of it was a little bit more direct. And that was that we created a rubric, a, a means, a standard to look at all of those fish at the same time using the same set of criteria to really get a gauge on not just what was politically important or what was economically important and therefore had had a petition filed on the Endangered Species Act, but what was the actual extinction threat of each one of those species? And when we did that, we got something that was very dramatic and pretty stark. I mean, it surprised Peter and I as much as anything else. Over three quarters of the freshwater fish species, I'm gonna use species lightly there, right? That could be subspecies, it's, it's uh, distinct taxa, evolutionarily significant taxa, are on a pretty steep decline. That can be pretty depressing. And quite frankly, we get depressing environmental news daily, right? It almost feels like that is the norm. In this era of climate change, the existential threat of impending disaster, impending extinction, it's either drought or flood. Hmm? Does that feel pertinent today? What did we just do in Sacramento? From the longest dry period to the single wettest 24 hour period? switch in one day, those swings can be hard on us. But the more I worked on this, the more I thought, and, and Peter was really important in this. There's a bigger story. What's really surprising when you think back about those slides I was showing about the wholesale change of what a river actually is, is not that we have a whole bunch of endangered species. What's amazing is we've only lost seven given that fundamental change. The landscape. These are so tenacious, these native critters. They are so persistent. And so this whole lecture is about believing in them and about believing this simple fact that if you, if we can give California's native fish, the rivers, the aquatic ecosystems that they can recognize, they're not gonna be the same. We're not moving back. But if you can supply them with the right cues, similar patterns, what we'll see is dramatic response. Next slide, please. So here's just a, you know, a little tour. Um, this is the right class, I suppose. Okay, I'm not gonna ask fish by fish. Yell out which one would you know there. What, okay, I guess I am. What's this? All right, we'll start with family, people. What kind of fish? Salmonid, that's right. You, this big eye will give this one away. Do you know different species of salmonids yet? This is a coho. The coho versus right here, this is Oncorhynchus micus, the coastal rainbow trout. If that fish goes out to the ocean and this one was headed that way, I caught it in a, in a trap uh, on the lower Russian river, then you call it a steelhead, right? And what's the word for a, for a fish that's born in freshwater and heads to the ocean? And then comes back, do you know that? From the Greek, up swimming, yell it out. Anadromy, right? Anadromous, that's an anadromous fish, right? So these are three species of anadromous salmonid. This is the Chinook salmon, juvenile. The coho, why do you think this coho looks so different? Because it's evolved to a different set of habitats. It's the same river system as this one, but what about this fish is different? What do you see first? That eye, right? Why would you have a big eye? I can't hear through the masks, you guys yell. Murky water could be one reason. That could be one. What else about, about seeing not just murky, but right low light? So what kind of habitats are low light? Deeper water could be a piece of it. Often it's about being 
over in the edges, about deeper, slower undercuts in log jams in beaver ponds. This is an off-channel fish. The coho really is, is adapted for lower gradient streams. They're more marsh-like. Those off-channel, uh, by off-channel, I mean not in the middle of the river stream, but on the edge or even in a little oxbow lake, in a marsh, in a, in a beaver pond. In those low light conditions, it pays to have a big eye. But there's a whole bunch of other co-adapted traits that come with that, right? This guy is really made for, for channel. He can jump. I mean, these guys under condition, I think they might be able to climb trees. I've, I've gone up a steelhead is a much more acrobatic fish. And again, that comes from this, this difference. The steelhead is, is adapted for higher gradient channel-like streams and the coho for more of those off-channel type habitat. All right, what's this? Sturgeon, what's this? A great one for knowing in this, in this valley. That's, that's the Sacramento split tail. John Duran will give you some more information on the split tail at some point for sure. Here's one that you really should know. It looks like a tilapia. It's a, it has that same sunfish kind of look, but it's not. It's the only native of its, of, of Centrarca. Do you guys know that? The bass and sunfish family, which is mostly Eastern. It's the only native to this valley. This is the Sacramento perch. Sacramento perch is extirpated. What's extirpated mean? Locally extinct, right? It's not all the way gone, but it is extirpated. It's locally extinct within its native range. This was a fish that was on the Sacramento Valley floor uh, that would have been up in Clear Lake uh, in, in uh, low-lying uh, tributaries to the, to the Sacramento Valley. Um, and it is no longer found in any of them. The last the last fish I think was found down uh, in Sinole, in Sinole Creek. I don't remember exactly when, within our working lives, 20 years ago. Um, there are still lots of these fish in, in small ponds and in places, but the reason it is extinct is because it doesn't compete well against other non-native centrarchids. Why? Because the sunfish, the green sunfish, the, the uh, you know, just name them, the bluegill, um, you could go on and on. They tend to be brood, they, they protect their brood, they guard their brood, this guy doesn't. So they, when they come in, they just eat, the, the other sunfish eat all their eggs basically. Um, anyway, we don't have too much, oh, this top one. That's not the devil's whole pupfish, but it is a pupfish and they all look pretty dang similar, right? Um, oh man, I could talk about pupfish the whole time. Next slide. This guy you've heard of, right? A certain three inch fish. Dr. Durand spends a lot of time thinking about those. Uh, I'll let him do most of it, but they seem to be just about gone in the wild. All right. Central Valley Chinook, that's what we should be talking about today. Uh, there's four different runs of Central Valley Chinook. So when they say there's four species of salmon, there's species under the Endangered Species Act. Salmonids get special treatment under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, it's called an ESU or an evolutionary significant, evolutionarily significant unit. Uh, and it is the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is actually in the Commerce Department, which decides that. It's a little strange, just uh, some, some, legacy of, of old bureaucracy, but the anadromous fish are actually covered by an entirely different uh, branch of government than the freshwater fish. Freshwater fish are covered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, but because they go out into the ocean, they are governed by the Commerce uh, Department, which has jurisdiction over the ocean. So the ESU uh, de designates these these parts of the population that are, you know, it's the same species, but they're on a totally different trajectory. They're doing something completely else. And we call them runs. What? So there's a fall run. That's the, the largest uh, run nowadays. It's the, the, the one that the, the fisheries are uh, really largely dependent on. And it is largely produced in hatcheries. Then we have a spring run, a winter run, and a late fall run. Uh, they're named for the time 
of season in which they come out of the ocean and enter the rivers. Why would we have three different runs in the valley or four? Excuse me. The same thing we've just already been talking about today. Shout it out. Don't be shy. What? Water flow is a big piece of that, right? You have four different runs of the same species, right? And they're reacting to what? Water flow. And the water flow reacts to what? To season is a piece of that, right? To the pattern, really, of the, of the way that water flows across the landscape. And so what we have is this incredibly diverse place, California, right? With a very distinct set of hydrologic conditions. We have a drought every summer. Right? It doesn't rain for six, seven months a year, most years. You can't be an anadromous fish trying to go through the Central Valley when the water is low, when it's warm, far outside your, your thermal tolerances, right? And full of predators. That doesn't make sense. The fish is going to honed by eons of natural selection, going to find the right key to the landscape flock, right? And what we have is these different, these broadly different hydrologic patterns. The fall run comes in with fall and winter rains. It's gonna take advantage of the water coming up in the Central Valley, rainstorms like the one we just experienced. The fish are gonna come out of the ocean, get up into the gravels about, you know, up by Redding or into the Feather River, into the Yuba, into the San Joaquin, get up into three or 4,000, 5,000 feet. But really, it tends to be right about that level of the foothills. Lay their eggs in the gravel. The water's relatively warm down low. Those fish will hatch early, and they will get out of the Central Valley before it gets so hot that they would boil, that they would be beyond, be beyond their thermal tolerance. The spring run has a different, different strategy. It surfs that snow melt, especially in the San Joaquin, which drains the high Southern Sierra. The water crests consistently much later in the season than in the Sacramento. The Sacramento is more dependent on rainfall and the San Joaquin, at least historically, was a snow melt driven system. So those spring run are actually coming in in the spring, riding that high water up higher into the mountains where they hang out in deep river canyons over summer. And then they fall back down onto the valley to spawn. They're finding a way to reproduce in these diverse life history strategies. The winter run is unique to California and it's unique to California because nowhere else has year round volcanic springs like those that come out of Lassen and Shasta. So the upper Sacramento, the McLeod River, the pit, the fall, these are places where before European development and before the dams, fish would have had a clear shot up in winter to get into springs that basically are underground rivers come to the surface full of cold water. If that's what they needed was cold water year round, then the time to get there was when the water was most consistently within the rivers, winter. Each one of these life history strategies, the natural history of these fish is what we have to understand if we're gonna tailor a landscape that they can recognize. Because we know that we've fundamentally changed those patterns. And we know that if we don't do something, we'll lose them. The easiest thing, winter run are right there with the Delta smelt as the fish that are just about the most endangered, but they also have the most political impact on California's economy because those populations and how they do have the greatest impact on how water is diverted and moved through our reservoirs and our rivers and our canals and diverted. The winter run used to go up to the upper Sacramento, to the pit, to the fall, like I was talking about. What keeps them from getting there now? A dam, which dam? Not on the Klamath. It's on the Sacramento River, built in the 40s. You all know its name. 
you go over a really, really big reservoir if you're headed up on I-5. I won't say this. You guys have to say it before I go far up. I'm just like, Shasta. All right. So Shasta Reservoir, Shasta Dam blocks the winter run from all of their historical spawning habitat. We are now trying to keep that fish alive several thousand feet lower than it would have historically with releases from Shasta Dam. So how hot is it in Reading, my friends? Extremely. Extremely hot. We are trying to keep a population of cold, loving fish alive on the valley floor in summer by releasing water from our largest reservoir, which has the greatest impact on our state's economy. It's not a great set of objectives. I don't think anyone would have said, let's do that, right? So part of what we're talking about today is reimagining what might actually work. We will fail if our objective is to keep winter run going on the valley floor in Reading. But there are options. All right. So this is just another way. This the Sacramento Valley. The Sutter Buttes are right in the middle. Some people call them the world's smallest mountain range. Others say that they're the, the most southerly extension of the Cascades. Regardless, it's a, they're a beautiful spot right in the middle of the Sacramento Valley. I highly encourage you all to go check them out. But this is just a, another picture showing that incredible diversity of different wetland habitats, right? This was pre-development. Next, this is what remains today. Almost nothing. 95% of those wetlands are now cut off, divorced from the river channels where the fish are stuck by dams. Next. But that landscape is still there. We haven't fundamentally altered the underlying bones, the topography. We've changed the slope slightly, but if you overlay the existence of rice fields on top of that, you see that the marshes are still present. They're just being managed for a different set of productivity. We've taken natural productivity and natural abundance and traded it for the primary productivity of agricultural production. What used to make fish food and duck and goose and elk and pronghorn and antelope. An incredible, th th this, this landscape was, was kind of like, it was like the Okavango. It was this incredible, it, it was one of the world's great wildlife landscapes on earth, right? And we've turned it into one of the most productive agricultural. But does that trade off necessarily have to be? So, these are rice fields. The rice fields occupy those, those deep marsh habitats that uh, basically are adjacent to the river system. Next. And it's really important to recognize that we're not going back, right? The Yolo Basin is not gonna turn into 100,000 acres of waving tulies 14 feet tall again anytime soon, right? This is one of the most lucrative and most productive agricultural landscapes on earth. Okay, next. Let's see, I thought, we could go forward a couple of, well, all right, uh, we'll go back. So understanding that, understanding, and you know, some of our, our colleagues did some amazing work to show that not only are puddles and marshes really important to ducks and geese, but they're also fundamentally important to fish, right? And salmon themselves aren't just meant to be in the river. And the river isn't just meant to be in its banks, but that when the river spreads and slows, when it connects with those marshes, that the small fish would have spilled out into those habitats and taken advantage of the incredible productivity that was there, right? And so, we had this idea, oh my gosh, now that we know that natural marshlands, natural wetlands, natural floodplains, right? Those adjacent flat, formerly marshlands that are adjacent to rivers, that they're important to fish, to juvenile fish, to the fish that would go out and eat in those things. What, is it possible that we take the way that we manage those lands now and mimic, do our best to recreate 
the same set of, of biophysical conditions. What do we mean by biophysical? Both the depth of the water, the temperature of the water, but also the fact that given those conditions, you get an eruption of life. You start to see microbial action, which builds into invertebrate action, which suddenly you have a whole bunch of, of food biomass. Would a fish put into the corner of a rice field? Would a salmon in a mud puddle? Is that, is that, is that something that might actually work? So that's, that's the experiment we undertook uh, when I was uh, here at UC Davis with John. Next, next slide. So we were just out here in uh, Yolo Bypass, you know, the, the causeway that separates Davis from Sacramento. Just to the left, if you were looking up there, was the ranch on which we worked. Next slide, please. After rice harvest, so uh, rice is planted in spring. Um, it is, the, the fields are former marshlands, right? And they're managed as such. Rice is a, is a marsh grass. It likes to grow in water. Throughout the summer, the water is maintained. In late summer, that water is drained off so it can be dry enough to get the harvesters out there. In October, sometimes early November, everything should be totally harvested. After that, next slide, we went out into the corner of a rice field. It was a 200 acre field and we threw up a little berm around five acres or so. We built these pens, next, next slide. There were, I don't even remember anymore, a lot of pens. Next. We finally convinced the California State, you know, the, the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife to give us some fish. That's what's in that truck. Next slide. Really small fish. These are about the, the, the same size as fish that would naturally be coming out of the gravels of the Sacramento River. About the size of your thumbnail. Next slide. Each one of those fish, well, not each one. We had about 10,000 fish. We took a subsample of those. We measured them for length, next. For weight, next. A subsample of those were inserted with this small electronic tag. It's called a passive integrated transponder. It has, you know, this was about 10 years ago, 2011. Uh, the technology had just got small enough that we could actually insert it into a small fish. Prior to this, the tags were so big that most of the research was done on very large fish. Large fish are not a great proxy for small fish. Um, so this was the first project where we actually could look at our actual target objective. The conservation was for these very small, naturally occurring fish. Here we were being able to put tags in and monitor their growth and survival. Uh, this is basically just a little copper coil in there. Uh, that emits an alphanumeric uh, uh, signal. So it's the same thing as, as fast track, right? Except when our fish either goes through one of our antennas or we wand it, right? It doesn't bill your credit card, but it lets us know that this is Alice, this is Frank. We can actually track individual fish and therefore have much higher statistical power in our, in our observation. Next. Right, so those get inserted into the body cavity of the fish themselves. Next. Um, those fish are put out into the pens as well as free swimming out throughout the field. Uh, and we measured them every two weeks, either by uh, pulling them out of these ponds. This is Nick Corline, who was in this class when I hired him uh, to do this. I was a grad student. He's now uh, in a PhD program. Uh, oh, where's Nick? University of Virginia. Uh, fantastic. I mean, he's so much smarter than I am. All right, next. Um, after six weeks, right, after a month and a half, we drained that field, we measured it, and, and we were really interested. So here's that field. What is it? It's a mud puddle. It's just a little bit of water staying out on the landscape. But that's fundamentally different than the way we treat the rest of the landscape, right? The landscape, whether it's your backyard, whether it's a Safeway parking lot or every single ag field, what do we do? We get that water off as quick as possible. A rice field is a different place for one reason not because the rice itself is particularly, you know what I mean, but because it is engineered to hold on to water. You have shallow puddles. Those shallow puddles mimic the wetlands that would have been there before. So we drained it. We drained it through this box. We had a little trap and this is what we saw. Oh, no, sorry, wrong picture. <laughs> Keep going, I don't know how that get in there. Oh, uh, yeah, 
That is that is the largest uh, salmonid in the world. This is the taimen, taimen hucho. Uh, this is from the uh, river that drains uh, Lake Bacal and comes across the border into Mongolia. Uh, I caught this fish on a squirrel fly. Um, we are with our good friend Sudeep Chandra, who has a conservation program. We've just done a surgery and in, uh, uh, inserted a radio tracker so that he can track these large fish as they go up and down the egg in the Selenge River, where a Chinese-backed uh, gold mine is proposing a large dam. The dam was just to make electricity for more, for, for more mining, but it would block off the last migratory pathways for these fish. So uh, that's an aside though. This is pretty fun. All right. Um, these are the readers. We could uh, check those fish as they came out and we would have a, you know, a bi-weekly uh, record of how fast they grew. And this is what we saw. Next. The fish are basically doubling their weight every week. This is fundamentally different than what happens in the river. The river, the fish don't grow very fast. Out on the floodplain, we see this, this doubling, tripling, quadrupling so that we get a much larger fish within a month, month and a half, within the regular time frame that you would have historically seen these wetland connections between river and floodplain. Next. Right. And that led us um, on a on an odyssey, really. We spent years looking at how rice fields might be improved so that fish put into those, obviously, I mean, what could be less wild than a rice field, right? It's laser leveled. What does that mean? It means there's a GPS on the tractor that keeps it not perfectly flat, but just tilted enough that water drains off, right? That there's no cover whatsoever. There's no large logs. There's no waving tulies. That does not seem like a natural place to be a fish. Hence, no one had even tried this. And we still, once seeing that, were highly skeptical. We thought, well, what if we had deeper drains? What if we harvested the rice so that the stubble was left high and that gave cover to the fish? What if we left more biomass of rice in the field so you get more microbial action, you get more carbon converted to bacteria. Bacteria are eaten by small bugs. Small bugs are eaten by small fish. Small fish rapidly get bigger. Wouldn't that make a difference? And we tested each one of those things really rigorously. And what we found in the end was no, that the fish when exposed to these long residence time, residence time means the water is in the same place. It's staying together out there. The food web is intact. When that happens for three weeks, it didn't matter if you were on corn stubble, wild, you know, like weeds, uh, rice in a riparian zone. After three weeks, water went from clean and clear to absolutely seething with bugs. And the fish grew really, really rapidly. So what we were seeing was the fish responding to this pattern, the biophysical, the set of bio, biophysical conditions through time that, that mimics what would happen historically. And what was really critical here was that there was only a couple postage stamp, really, a couple small areas where we could do that, you know, recreate that same kind of biophysical condition for fish on the valley floor, right? Most of the marsh is separated from the rivers by levees. Those levees cost more than $10 million a mile to build. And if you want to put gates, other ways to get fish and water out of the floodplain onto the, onto the, you know, the formerly activated floodplain, it was going to be a huge, huge expense, right? But there were these wonderful things called bypasses. The bypasses, like the one that you guys all should know, right? YOLO bypass. We live right next to it. What are they? They're high pressure release valves for flood. Basically, it rains so much in the Sacramento Valley on occasion. It should sink in, right? You guys remember what it sounded like on the roof last night and the night before, right? It happens episodically. But when that much water falls, there's no way that you can build 
walls high enough along the rivers to keep it all in. You needed to have places that spilled back out, like those old flood basins, flood basins, right? And so we, we in our infinite wisdom, really uh, a, a guy named uh, uh, Will Green, who was one of the, the founders of the town of Calusa, had this idea. He said in the 1860s, he said, hey, let's make these two places where we're not going to build in there. We're not going to have any cities. We'll have low spots in the levees. So when the water comes up, instead of spilling over I Street and flooding downtown Sacramento, it goes into the Yolo Bypass. Bypass it. It bypasses the water around the city of Sacramento and sends it down into the Delta. So we had these places that still connected to the river on occasion. And what the statistics, what the data shows is that three years after we get a big flood event, we get a lot of salmon back in the valley. It tends to be the years when we have large enough floods to get fish out onto Yolo Bypass. That's when we get a population level response. That's when we start to see fish coming back. And for a long time, people have thought, well, we need more water in the river then in drier years. And absolutely, that's an important piece. But what our work shows is that it's not just about water in the river, it's about the water out of the river. That a big flood event, all those puddles you rode your bike through today, each one of those is hosting the same kind of food webs that we talked about a second ago, or we'll talk about here in a minute more. The whole system of drainage becomes overwhelmed in those storms. And in so doing, you start to get for just a brief period, that natural productivity, that incredible engine of productivity is alive again on the landscape. Just more minutes. All right, let's just roar through this. So what happened then, was that in the, uh, when I was a kid in Davis, every summer, the sky was so choked with smoke that, I mean, it was horrible. And there was a rash of, of asthma and the legislature passed the Rice Residue Burning Act. It was so smoky because the rice farmers burned their fields after harvest. That changed. Uh, because of clean air legislation. But the second best thing to do with those rice fields to deal with that stubble was to flood them. And suddenly in, starting in the late, late 80s and then into the early 90s, um, these ducks and geese that were at all time low numbers, like our fish are now in the early 80s, they looked down beneath their wings and suddenly they saw all that marshland bloom again beneath their wings. They saw the rebirth of what we call the Pacific Flyway. And now we have all time high numbers of geese in the valley and duck populations, right? It's not the best numbers ever, but just since we've been counting. And that's because there has been a fundamental change in the availability of habitat across a working landscape. Did we go back to marshes? No, but those same farm fields supply that kind of habitat for these birds. All right, so we thought maybe we might be able to do the same thing for fish. Um, and we, we created a, a laboratory out there at, at landscape scale, next. Uh, we, um, this is Nags at sunset during a storm, uh, Nags Ranch next. We did all these different uh, uh, farm practice experiments, which we don't have time to get into. But again, what we found was that the fish did really well in wetted floodplains. Next, keep going. Just run through these and I'll tell you when to stop. Yeah, so we, we basically ended up moving throughout the valley, doing similar experiments and finding similar results, right? That after three weeks or so next, you end up with these floodplain fatties. All right, let's go next. This is the experiment that might really gel what we're talking about. 2016, it was the, the heart of this drought, but we had one flood event. The river came up, you're looking at the Sacramento just north of I-5, into the Sacramento in an eddy, we placed three uh, floating pens. Each one of those had 10 pit bag fish. And then we went just 30 yards over the, uh, over the levee onto the floodplain. Next, this is the canal. Canals are the way that water flows across the floodplain now, right? We did three more of these kinds of floating cages with fish in them, and then, just out of the canal onto the, onto the floodplain surface. Next, 
which is these agricultural fields. It was the drought. There wasn't enough water to actually plant rice. So you just have weeds out there. Next. And what we found was really similar now, right? The river fish were much smaller than the floodplain fish. The canal fish were intermediate, but we saw why. Next. Right, 700% more growth in just three weeks for those floodplain fish. Next. But we looked at the water. This is a water, this is, represents a, a cubic meter of water in the Sac River. It had about 1,500 bugs in it. There was about 10,000 in the canal. I mean, six times as many, 600% more food. That's huge. On the floodplain, 150 times. That's 15,000% more food. Imagine if you were a CEO and you returned 15,000% greater profits, you'd be rewarded. What we now understand is that those floodplains were the incredible engines of natural wealth. They created fish biomass, right? How do you make a, how do you make a salmon population? Which is to say, how do you make a vibrant, consistent California economy? You do it by actually having a functioning river ecosystem. And you do that by mimicking natural flood patterns out there on the landscape. Thank you. Thanks. Today often is sold as like in the drought state, like we don't have any water. 